Hello, Tanse, everyone. Tanse, Nita Timdek, Tan Esperanto, and it's Sigasan, Nia Apitawi Gosi, Sin, Segi Tawak, Nitsotzin. Hello, everybody. My name is Tan Esperanto. I'm a member of the Metis Nation of Alberta from Region 6, Beast River. I am uh, zooming in from Manahata, the Lenape Island here in New York City in Hill's Kitchen. And I'm here to welcome you to our first Facebook Live event. We are so excited to be creating this space for a live interview with Connie Walker, hosted by Sutton King. And as this is on Facebook, if you would like to ask any questions or have any comments, just drop them in the comments under the video and we'll try to get to them. Um, if we can't get to them live, then we'll get to them after. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Sutton to take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Tanis. For sure. Shukoli, Sutton King, New Gats and Guahuay Ni'i, Wakna Tana Wagita Lota, Oniota Aga Ni'i. Hello, welcome. Um, it's so great to be gathered here virtually uh, during the uh, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, Trans and Two-Spirit Week of Remembrance. Um, my name is Sutton King and I'm Afro-Indigenous of the Menominee and Oneida Nations of Wisconsin. I am the co-founder uh, and president of the Urban Indigenous Collective, which is a grassroots organization uh, here in Lenape Hoking or so-called New York City, uh, advocating on behalf of the rights of urban natives. Uh, UIC, in partnership with Sovereign Bodies Institute, is currently funded uh, by seven generations to de develop and implement uh, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, Trans, and Two-Spirit New York City Database, uh, which really seeks to document the scope of violence experienced by Natives and Indigenous women in the New York City tri-state area from 1900 to present. And we're working with uh, Sovereign Bodies Institute, SBI, uh, who's really generating new knowledge and understanding of how Indigenous nations and communities are being impacted by gender and sexual violence. Um, as a survivor of, of violence and a family member of a missing and murdered Indigenous woman, Ingrid Washington-Mattock, who was taken from us in 1999, um, it's really important for me to do this work and highlight the work of others who are doing this. And with that, I would like to introduce you all uh, to to someone I'm sure you all are very familiar with, the award-winning investigative reporter, Connie Walker. Uh, Connie, it is so great to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it, and I'm happy to join you. Great. Uh, Connie, can you tell us more uh, about yourself and uh, really why you've dedicated your work to raising awareness around the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, trans, and two-spirit? Sure. I, I mean, I grew up, uh, I'm Cree from Saskatchewan. Um, I grew up in Treaty 4 territory in southern Saskatchewan. Um, um, and all of my family still lives at home in my community. So, um, you know, I, I feel like the sad and tragic reality is that so many of us as Indigenous women are survivors of, of violence and are impacted by this crisis of violence that is ongoing and exists in our communities. And, and that, I think that my experience as, my lived experience as an Indigenous woman, um, you know, means that, that, you know, I've also been a survivor of violence. And for me, I think that, you know, I, I, this work started for me, I think, you know, when I first started thinking about becoming a journalist was when I was in high school. And I talk about this in in the podcast Stolen that I'm I'm hosting now, Stolen, The Search for Jermaine. Um, I talk about uh, an Indigenous woman who was killed in Saskatchewan near where I grew up. Um, she was from the Sakame First Nation. Her name was Pamela George. I didn't know Pamela George, um, but I... I, you know, I've been to Sacame. We used to go to Powell's there when I was a, a kid. And I remember being in high school when the, these two uh, white university students were on trial for her murder in Regina. And the thing that I remember, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a high school student who paid much attention to the news in general, I wouldn't say, but I remember, you know, I feel like everyone was paying attention to, to Pamela George and, and to the two men who were on trial for her murder, because I felt like most of the attention and most of the coverage was actually on them, on these two white university students and the way that they were talked about. And, you know, I, I felt mm -hmm. like there was such a disconnect, you know, one, I, 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 I talk about it a lot whenever I, I, I do speaking engagements and I actually found like um, a news clip from the time from like the national newscast where 
um, they're talking about the trial and they say, Alex Ternowetsky, who was the name of one of the one of the men who was accused in Pamela's murder, they say Alex Ternowetsky, the basketball star, and Stephen mm. Comerfield, the hockey standout. And then they say, and the victim was an Aboriginal prostitute. And they they don't, mm-hmm. you know, that 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 is what we learned about Pamela through the media. And, you know, we didn't hear about the fact that she was um, a single mom of two young kids and that she was a daughter and a sister and an auntie and a cousin. And I remember feeling that so much of the attention and focus was on these two two white men who were eventually acquitted in her murder um, and convicted of manslaughter and s- sentenced to six and a half years um, in prison, despite the fact that they, you know, they admitted to picking picking her up and and, you know, committing horrible violence against her. And I and I think that, you know, I, I remember just how that felt, you know, I think mm-hmm. as you know, I think that as an Indigenous woman, I grew up experiencing um, things and maybe I didn't have the the capacity to name everything that I had right. felt or experienced at that point. But I remember the fact that it was like in the news and written in black and white and that this was accepted and acceptable treatment. Right. Um, of Pamela made me really angry. And that was the first time I, I wrote something um, for the school newsletter and thought about becoming a journalist, but it would be mm. decades mm-hmm. before I, you know, I, and I, I never imagined that I would get to be at this point where I'm at now, where I'm, I'm almost right. exclusively focused on reporting, not just on Indigenous issues, but about this crisis of violence that we face as Indigenous women and girls. Um, that's something I, I never could have even imagined when I first started my career. Mm, and it's interesting, you know, where, where oftentimes, you know, the white dominant culture gets to control the narrative, right? Um, and how powerless we feel as Indigenous women um, when we're seeing uh, our relatives, our family members, you know, described in that way. Um, mm-hmm. And it almost sounds like there was a, a trauma response within yourself um, and you were able to write, you know, which is your talent, your gift, and be able to express those feelings in which you were, you know, uh, experiencing, even if you weren't able to name it at that time, right? And how important it is for us as Indigenous women um, to use our voices. And oftentimes that does come out of a a trauma response, right? And, um, you know, you you mentioned your your podcast, Stolen, and the search for Jermaine, um, which is on Spotify. And if you have not checked it out, please check it out. Um, But for those who are not familiar, with the podcast. Um, who is Jermaine Charlo um, and, and what is the podcast uh, about? Sure, yeah. I, um, Jermaine um, is a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes in southwest or in northwestern Montana. Um, she, she lived and grew up on the Flathead Reservation just north of Missoula. Um, and in 2018, in, in June, 2018, she was one of hundreds of young people, um, enjoying a summer night in Missoula in, in June. Missoula is a really vibrant college town if you've never been there. Um, and, and I, when I was there reporting on this story, you know, I went out on a Friday night in mid June just to get a sense of, of what it might've been like the, the night that Jermaine was out there. And, and it's just filled with, you know, there's lots of bars and restaurants and it's filled with lots of people, um, you know, it's, uh, just out and about, um, in Missoula and on June 15th, 2018, Jermaine Charlo was, was one of them. Um, she was downtown Missoula and she was, um, you know, at a bar called the Badlander, which is right downtown. Um, and just after midnight, uh, she left the Badlander and was last seen, uh, captured on surveillance footage, uh, walking down the alley behind the Badlander bar and turning a corner. And and that was the last confirmed sighting of Jermaine Charlo. And and since then, Jermaine is, is you know, she was a, a young mom to two boys, um, she's, you know, she has uh, a family who, who live and are on the Flathead Reservation, um, who have been desperate for answers about Jermaine's disappearance and doing everything they can to try to advocate for her in her absence and, and try to bring Jermaine home. You know, her grandmother, Vicky is, is somebody that we meet, um, you know, right away in, in the podcast, her aunts, Valinda Morgeau. Um, and, and Danny Matt have been some of her biggest advocates. Her mother, uh, Jen, 
uh, as well. Um, you know, Jermaine, Jermaine comes from a really, um, you know, a family of really strong indigenous, um, resilient women, um, who themselves are, are also survivors of, of violence. And, and I, you know, I think that in reporting on not just Jermaine's case, but in reporting on other cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, you know, I think what I've noticed is that so many of the people who are become advocates and become activists and who are raising awareness and who are pushing these stories into the spotlight um, are our family members are people who who have lost someone in their family like Jermaine's family has and who are using their voice to try to to um, get answers but also help raise awareness about this crisis of violence and and Jermaine's family has has been doing that so our podcast is is an eight part podcast so it's all eight episodes focused on Jermaine Charlo's case you know we're we're you know, we're trying to, in the podcast, find as much answers as we can about her disappearance. Um, but I know as an Indigenous woman, and, and I'm sure you know as well, Sutton, that, that you know, our stories don't, you know, Jermaine's story didn't begin on the night she went missing. And, and so much of our podcast is about trying to also um, tell a bigger story about Jermaine's life and what, what led to that night in June? Um, you know, what experiences did she have in her childhood or in her, you know, as an adult that, that are, are really things that, so experiences that so many of us share and really trying to shed a light and, and show how Jermaine Charlo is, is also, a representative of, of thousands of other Indigenous women and girls across the country. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and you know, you've got to think about all of the different, like you said, the, uh, her story began before she went missing, right? And all of the safety nets that were not there for her to protect mm-hmm. her, right? And I, while I was listening to the podcast, I thought, of, you know, so many different times, why didn't someone step in there? What if a police officer would have, you know, connected her to the support she needed? Um, there were so many different opportunities where folks could have helped her, right? And I think that's the same story for so many other Indigenous women. Um, that there, there are opportunities and resources needed to support our, our relatives before they go missing, before they are murdered. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there are so many stories um, like Jermaine's, right? What was it about Jermaine's story that stuck out to you that made you want to focus in on her story specifically, knowing that there are so many stories out mm-hmm. there that are untold? Yeah, that is a, a, that is such a tricky question to answer because um, I I think that 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 point is is exactly right that you know every single Indigenous woman and girl and every single family member who has lost somebody or who is searching for answers and desperate for information deserves uh, attention and resources like like this what we're you know I I feel so lucky and privileged that I am in a position to be able to to get to do the work that I do and hopefully try to raise awareness about. Germain, but also this this broader issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. But the reality is that all of our stories are so underrepresented in media. You know, there there aren't enough stories done about MMIW. There aren't enough stories done about Indigenous sovereignty. There aren't enough stories done about Indigenous humor, Indigenous love, like Indigenous resilience. Like they're, they're, all of our stories are so underrepresented and they're really especially around this crisis of violence that indigenous women and girls face um you know this is not a new issue this is something that has been ongoing for you know decades if not hundreds of years in canada and in the united states and and you know there there should be more than one podcast uh, focused on on this issue and we need to have so many stories so i i i you know i don't want ever want to have families think that like, oh, one story is more deserving of attention than another story. Um, that's, that's not at all, all the case. Um, but for the, for the work that we do in the podcast, which is like an in- investigative podcast, and we really try to take a really, um, deep dive into, like I said, you know, Jermaine's, the investigation into Jermaine's disappearance. And so, you know, we're, um, finding out information and, and getting access to documents that, that tell the story of what the police have been investigating, interviewing police officers, people who have done searches, you know, trying to, to dive as deeply as we can. Um, 
and and that's something that you know I I feel like every case should get that kind of attention. For for Jermaine, you know, I'm from Canada, and a, a lot of my reporting has been based here in Canada, especially around um, MMIWG. And and when I first thought about going to the United States and and joining Gimlet Media and reporting on this issue in the U.S., um, you know, I. I realized that there were going to be a lot of similar experiences, I think, that we share on both sides of the border uh, in terms of being impacted by colonization and this issue of, of violence. But um, but I, I also knew that I am not the expert on what it means to be a Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribe member um, from Montana or Cherokee or, you know, that, that there's so much about the uh, Indigenous experience in the U.S. that I, I don't know and I don't understand. So, um, you know, I, I really set out to, to learn about it and to learn from the people who are doing this work. So I connected with Sovereign Bodies Institute and I, I learned more about the work that they're doing. Um, they told me, um, Anita told me about a conference that was happening in Arizona last January, 2020, um, that was about sex trafficking, but you know, these issues are so closely linked. Um, and so I, I went to this conference and I met Indigenous women from across the United States who were all working to prevent violence in their communities and and who often were advocates because of this personal experience that they had, that they had lost somebody. And it was there that I met a woman named Lauren Small Rodriguez, and she works with trafficking uh, victims in Missoula, Montana. And she first told me about Jermaine Charlo. And one of the first things that I saw was that photo of Jermaine that we used in the cover art for the podcast. And it, it's a selfie, I think, you know, but she's looking directly into the camera and her eyes are so piercing. And, and I just felt like, you know, just so engaged, um, with her. And, and, and as soon as, um, you know, I, I did a little bit of research, I, you know, I knew I wanted to know more and, and, um, you know, I, I think that, that like so many other cases that that there there are so there's so much information that we don't understand about about these cases and 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 these police investigations um that that really made me curious and wanted to know more about Jermaine right and you know there being such a need um and there not being many Connie Walkers in, in the space right um but how do you how do you navigate that um, you know, knowing that there are so many different stories that do need to be told mm. and you being just one person, right? Well, um, yeah. I mean, I think that they're like, they're, I'm, not, I'm, I'm the one person who, who is getting to work on this podcast, but there are, there are tons of indigenous, really talented, mm. amazing indigenous journalists out there Thank working you. in Canada and the mm -hmm. U S right now. Like they're, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's actually like, it's so inspiring to know that, the, mm. like how many people are out there pushing our stories into the spotlight and and demanding attention and amplifying voices from our communities and i think that you know the reason we've been so underrepresented is because mm -hmm. you know we we there aren't still aren't enough of us there you know mm. there still are not enough of us in newsrooms and we need to um you know we need to be asking the questions if you're in those spaces, if you're a journalist, like what can you be doing to support indigenous indigenous people telling our own stories? And mm -hmm. because we are the ones who are in the best position to tell these stories, you know, we have the lived experience mm -hmm. that gives us, you know, the the important context that's needed to understand how this issue of violence against indigenous women is connected back to colonization is connected back right. to this shared history is connected back to the institutional racism that we experience um throughout our lives you know right. connected back to the dispossession from our lands like mm. you know the loss of language and culture like how all of these things are interconnected and i think that for me i was a news reporter for so many years and for most of my career there wasn't a recognition that these were important mm. stories or that that these were stories people were interested in and so you know i think that that 
that's changed and it's changing and it's been an incredible transformation, but we need to keep going. Like there, there needs to be more people who are empowered to take on these stories and more people who are, who are given the resources and support needed to, to share and tell these stories. And those of us who are in newsrooms now, like we need to be thinking about like, are these safe spaces for people mm. from marginalized communities? Are these safe spaces for indigenous people? What can, can and should we be doing to try to ensure? And especially if you're, an editorial leader or a thought leader or somebody who has a, a leadership role, um, you know, we, this is a good start. This is, I, I couldn't have imagined that we would have gotten here, but now that we sure. are, like we need mm-hmm. to keep going. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, cheers to that and, and keeping going. Right. And, you know, um, being able to look at this through your indigenous lens, right, as an indigenous woman um, with lived experience, um, looking at this in an investigative way, um, what do you recognize as the true barriers on why this isn't solved? Right. Uh, mm. I, you know, it took 11 days for them to begin searching for Jermaine. Mm. Um, what yeah. are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, like that, that, I, unfortunately, that response um, or lack of response, I think, from law enforcement um, is, is all too familiar. Like that's something like from the very beginning of reporting on this issue, that's something that family members have said over and over and over and over again, that police or law enforcement didn't take their loved one's death or disappearance seriously right away. And that, and that is, uh, you know, I feel like that's a huge barrier to, to eventually getting, getting justice for, for families. Right. I, I remember, um, one of the stories I reported on in Canada was, um, was the disappearance, well, the unsolved case of Amber Tuckerow. And when her mother reported her missing, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police here in Canada, told her, oh, she's probably just out partying. Like, she'll she'll come back in a few days. And if that is the attitude from law enforcement, when you your alarm bells are going off, like, you know, I just have so much empathy and anger for families who have to experience that, who, you know, and for Jermaine's family, I think it was a very similar feeling. Like the day after she was last seen was the day that they were concerned. You know, the the first few missed phone calls um, that she didn't answer, the text messages that went um, unanswered, the lack of presence on social media were immediate red flags for her family. And they, they mobilized right away. You know, she was reported missing to tribal police on, on the Sunday. They tried to get her reported missing to, um, the city police and, and they ended up navigating like these jurisdictional kind of roadblocks in order to get her reported missing. And even once she was reported missing, you know, um, as you mentioned, like, you know, there was a detective who was eventually assigned, but he worked on her case for one day before he went on his weekend. And and her family says that, you know, the things that he spent doing on that day were things that they had already done, like calling the jails and calling the hospitals. And and when you have these unsolved cases, you know, I mean, Vicky um, Morjo, Jermaine's grandma, says at one point, like, Everybody knows the first few days and hours and are, are so important in in trying to figure out what happened. First and, 48, she said. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And and like her family, like they were concerned from there. Like yep. if they had gotten um attention and resources, you know, who, who knows what what would be happening right now, but but the mm-hmm. they didn't get it, and where they're at now is almost three years um after Jermaine's disappearance. They're still searching for answers. They're still searching for Jermaine and trying to to figure out um how to bring her home and and mm-hmm. they don't have the justice they want. They don't have the closure that they want. They don't um they don't know everything that they need to, they want to know about Jermaine. And that's a devastating thing. Like that's such that's such a, a devastating right. thing for families to be left wondering. Right. And I think, you know, 11 days, are we not worth those resources? And, you know, the stereotypes that we have to fight as Indigenous women, uh, whether we are, um, you know, sex workers or whether we are survivors of trafficking, um, what makes us, you know, um, less, you know, valuable to have those resources, right? Um, and that stigma that's, you know, um, attached, you know, or maybe she's partying or, may, you know, if a family is concerned and says, this is not normal for my mm-hmm. relative, uh, I'm concerned. 
Um, what is it going to take to really mobilize law enforcement um, to really have the same response that non-Indigenous women um, get when they go missing, right? Um, and I think that's something that um, is important for um, non-Indigenous peoples to look at, their own biases, right? Their own mm -hmm. settler biases um, that they need to unpack to be able to show up for Indigenous peoples and Indigenous women and be true allies. Um, because I think that, again, um, some there's a disconnect here that's happening and it's perpetuating. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the thing like about Jermaine's case as well is that like, you know, um, the, that in a lot of ways, I think our family felt like they were an, an anomaly because eventually, you know, they, they, mm -hmm. they did get assigned a detective who, who, uh, you know, they had, did eventually do a lot of um, in, investigating and a lot of work and put a lot of mm -hmm. effort into Jermaine's case. But, but I think that, 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 that question about, you know, like why things weren't taken seriously or, or what happened. Like, you know, we asked the Missoula police, we asked mm -hmm. detective Guy Baker about that. And, and the thing that he pointed to, which was, was that, you know, most missing adults are found is, is, is what he said, you know, that, that, you know, most people mm -hmm. within a certain amount of time come home or contact family, but, but, but the question about, you know, if your family is immediately concerned and if this is a, a serious red flag, you know, those, why weren't those resources there in the beginning is right. incredibly valid. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'd like to just ask you a question around um, the search warrant that was filed in Missoula County District Court uh, mm -hmm. for the cell phone um, of, of Jermaine. And mm -hmm. that was um, seen to be at or near uh, Michael DeFrance's residence between 2 a.m. or 10 a.m. Uh, on that morning she disappeared. Um, with us knowing these revelations and no arrests occurring, what are your thoughts around that? We have this evidence, we know this, but no no arrests have been made. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that like, I mean, our podcast um, is is obviously like trying to find out basically as much as we can about the police mm -hmm. investigation. And, and, and so, you know, obviously we, we try to get access to um, every document we could mm -hmm. uh, relating to Jermaine. Great job. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but they're not all public, like, they're, you know, and because this is a, an open and, and active case, um, there's still a lot that we, we, we don't know about, mm. um, about, um, what, what happened that night? I mean, I, I think that um, that right from the very beginning of our phone conversations with Detective Guy Baker, he talked about the importance of of cell phones and cell phone technology, right. but also how limited um, it it is in rural areas. That it's a lot easier um, when you're in a city and and there are multiple towers, and you are able to triangulate somebody's uh, location and, and use use the technology to your advantage in an investigation, but that that becomes more difficult um, when you're in a rural area. And, and certainly, you know, you know, I think that there, there are so many things that we don't, we don't um, know about Jermaine's case and, and things that we don't know about the police investigation. Um, but, but those questions are, are things that, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out in the podcast and, and really, um, you know, ask ask the questions about about how important those pieces of information are and and what and once you know them what what does that mean like you know somebody's phone can be somewhere but that doesn't necessarily mean they're there right right absolutely so I know we've got a few minutes left and I've got just a couple questions uh, remaining here for you. And, you know, one one thing I was really thinking about while listening to the podcast was what could law enforcement professionals do better? in supporting mm -hmm. Indigenous women, right? And I want to know, you know, through your investigation, what what are your thoughts around that? What are your recommendations? What can they do better that they're not doing? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that for for it's it's interesting to be a reporter and to be covering this issue in Canada and the United States because I feel like the two countries have taken different you know, approaches in, in trying to address this crisis of violence that exists, like certainly like um, law enforcement that is that is taking these cases seriously from the get go, you know, would make a huge would have a huge impact on on families and, and maybe on on cases as well. Um, but in Canada, you know, when this issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, was kind of pushed into the public consciousness and, and politicians responded. There was a national inquiry that was called, uh, th that was 
um, held across the country and hearing from survivors. And and it's interesting to see in the U.S. when now that this is, you know, it seems to be happening, it's getting more traction, it's getting more attention and politicians are beginning to to respond. And, and they've announced the creation of this MMIW unit um, that's going to actually be investigating cold cases, which I think that that is something that that just anecdotally from what I've heard from families is something that's very welcome, like that, that there is this um you know, need and want from families uh, who have loved ones who are missing or murdered uh, for their cases to to get a second look. And that's something that also was identified in the National Inquiry here in Canada, that there were so many people who were left wondering about their loved one and what happened um, that wished that there could have been more police resources, um, you know, given to those cases. And, and I'm so curious to know how how that impacts um, some of these cases and if they're able to resolve some of them, because I, I know that there are so many families like Jermaine's family who are still waiting for answers. Absolutely. And, you know, the final question for maybe uh, some Indigenous women or mm -hmm. um, Indigenous men who are in, in the audience right now and listening in, um, who may have a passion for uh, journalism, for writing, mm -hmm. who want to be future podcasters and bring attention to uh, Missing and Murdered, what are your what are your tips or advice to them? Um, gosh, I mean, I, I think that, that that we need we need you. <laughs> we need we need so many mm -hmm. um, indigenous people in journalism. And, and I think that um, like it's it's never been there's never been a better time to to be an indigenous journalist telling stories from our communities. I think there's finally finally, uh, a recognition that these are important stories and that people care about them and that there's an audience for them. And I think that we're in the best positions to tell stories about our communities. And, and it's, there's still so much work to do in terms of making sure that, that we're supporting Indigenous people and Indigenous journalists to tell these stories. Um, but I feel the sense of, of, solidarity and, and and community within the Indigenous journalist community in Canada and the U US is so supportive and strong. And and you know I I I and people can reach out to me directly and I'm happy to chat with anyone anytime and, and do whatever I can to help support people because um we, we need as many of you as possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Well thank you so much Connie and, and and Stina I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Um I know it is uh, 4.45 now. Just wanted to check in there. And if not, we can go ahead and, and wrap. Well, thank you okay. so much for having me. Yeah, no, it's been fantastic. Yeah. And I really appreciate it. Yes, and uh, for all those who uh, have joined us, please um, follow the podcast on Spotify, um, Stolen. Uh, such a great podcast, such a great story that's been told, uh, a true tragedy. And we really do hope uh, that that family gets some answers and many families uh, in our communities who st still do not have answers, right? Um, and again, just thank you for joining us. Please follow uh, Red House. Please follow uh, Connie Walker and please follow the Urban Indigenous Collective on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And we look to be in community with you. And it's so important to be able to connect uh, on these issues so that we're not in silos and that we can be in community. Uh, raise, raise awareness and really uh, bring the resources to our communities and our families uh, that, uh, that we need. Uh, Wawain and uh, Yako. Thanks so much, Sutton. Thank you, Connie.